I'm Vicky. Um, really lovely to be uh, here, sort of, with you all um, this morning. Um, and yes, we're going to talk about prison work. So um, there's a couple of polls um, throughout this. So if you haven't got poll everywhere or um, access to it, you can just type in the chat and I'll be able to um, see what you say in the chat as well. So that's me, Crime Week, Prison Works, Vicky. <clears throat> so this, I'm going to start with a question. So if you can answer this for me, and like I said, if, if Poll Everywhere isn't working for you, then please do um, just pop, pop your kind of answer in the chat. But if I was to say to you, prison works, question mark, so does prison work, what would you say? Would it be yes, no, or don't know? This is the bit where we need some kind of lift music. Whilst we wait, I won't sing to you though. <laughs> we have got some answers coming in in the chat function, Vicky. Lots of people are saying, mostly are saying no. Everybody's saying no, actually. Oh, good. <clears throat> oh, so I don't know. When I when I just did that, um, it, can you still see the slides or has it disappeared? No, I can still see the, the poll everywhere slide. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Because as soon as I open the chat, it um it disappears for me. Um, right. So yeah, so lots of no's. Oh, right. So so people have, have, have read the brief here. This is this is good. So sometimes we get a mix. And one of the kind of key parts about this um is that what are we measuring here? So if if I was asking what prison works is, it's a little bit of a um a kind of leading uh, question in some ways because we don't know what we're measuring. So when we say something works, we need to know what we're measuring against. And we'll come on to talk about some of those things um, as we go. But this is another um, another question to get you started. It's not a trick question. If I said to you, what is a prison? What would be your answer? So maybe the teachers can ask, ask the students and, and compile what the kind of answer would be. What is a prison? Where criminals go to be punished, freedom taken away is the punishment. Oh, brilliant, Megan. Uh, a place for offenders to serve their punishment, an institution that holds criminals to keep them away from society. Excellent. Are you sure you haven't all been on my course already? <laughs> I'm thinking maybe you should be giving the lecture. I can see a few more people um, type in. So let's see. Oh, you've got some now. Good. I'm glad. I, I'm glad everyone can hear me. <laughs> Legal system uses punishment for people who disobey the law and a risk to society. Yeah. So uh, punishment, uh, solitary confinement for offenders to serve their sentence and rehabilitate. Or it can be. It can be in a solitary sense. Absolutely. Yeah. So some really, really good, um, good ones there. So if we take a kind of dictionary definition of these and, and we've got a, we've got an Oxford, Oxford, Cambridge here. Let's let's keep it uh, keep it fair. Um, a building in which people are legally held. So you see some of the points that you were bringing out there saying about a building or an institution about the law um, legally held as punishment for a crime they have committed or while awaiting trial. Now, that's one thing we sometimes forget about with prison is that we tend to assume that everyone in prison deserves to be there, um, but also that everyone has been convicted um, when actually some people are, are detained within prison um, whilst they're either awaiting trial or awaiting a sentence. So if they haven't yet had a trial, they are legally innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. So that hasn't happened. So we do technically have innocent people, legally innocent people um, within prisons and also whilst awaiting sentencing. So people can be remanded into prisons called remand um, whilst they're awaiting a sentence, which might not be a prison sentence. We won't go into all of those kind of ins and outs today, but just to show you that it's even when we think something's quite simple when it comes to prisons, um, it generally isn't. It's very complex. And the Cambridge English Dictionary tells us it's a building where criminals are forced to live as a punishment. So you see building, punishment, criminal, crime, the kind of things that you were all bringing out in your um, responses there. So that's brilliant. Thank you. So prisons, buildings um, look 
generally in this country um something like this and they have a, they have a, a kind of wide range this is this is Wandsworth prison in London which is a Victorian prison um so quite old some we have some more modern um prisons which look a little bit uh different a little bit less austere than this but this generally there's uh, some kind of gate where the um security vans that you can see on the left there go in and out um, from and there's a building that houses prisoners and the inside if you've never been um, in a prison and it is quite a you know for good reason restricted space so this is one of the reasons that people like me um, and lots of others are so interested in what happens behind those closed doors because it is a very private, closed, cut off world in lots and lots of ways. So this is a kind of um, standard, what's called a landing. So you'll see there's a number of kind of bits of stairs there. Some go up, some go down. Um, depending on the size of the prison, there can be usually four um, kind of levels to each wing. And each one of them is called a landing. And you'll see the net in there so that people don't throw things from the top to the bottom, including themselves um, sometimes, sadly. Um, so all of those little kind of um, alcoves there, they would be cells, individual cells off there. So you can see just at a glance um, how many people could potentially be living um, in one wing. And remember this, to all intents and purposes, these are their homes. So when uh, people are out on what's called association, the, the individuals that live there, um, it looks a bit busier like this, you can see, but generally the same kind of thing, um, association on the wing landings. Um, another thing to kind of note there is there's one prison officer with all of those prisoners, maybe there's there might be another one just to the right. So generally speaking, prisoners outnumber prison officers, um, which is a key um a key part of the kind of relationship and the and the way and the mechanisms and with how prison works. Um, it works quite often on the kind of consent um, of the prisoners that they um, and the goodwill to kind of follow the rules and um, and behave and do those kind of things. Because as you can see there, those those prison officers would very quickly be outnumbered by the amount of prisoners that are there if the prisoners wanted um, to uh, react in a certain way. So those kind of relationships and how um, rules and, and things happen within the prison are really important in terms of maintaining the goodwill and the kind of uh, safety and security of the prison environment. So this is what a kind of uh, cell um, would potentially look like. A lot of people have to share cells, so um, I'll come on to say a bit about this later. But um, we've been we've had an overcrowded prison estate um, every year for about the past eighteen to twenty years, I think. Um, so some part of the prison estate is overcrowded. We're above what we should be um, for our kind of uh, normal occupancy. So most people um, that are in prison have to share a cell, and some people have. There are three in a cell when we've been at the height of overcrowding. It's generally two now. Um, so this is what, so you can see how getting on with your pad mate, um, as they're quite often called, um, would be really important because there's not much room <laughs> in there. Um, you know, and if you've ever shared a room with a sibling um, or anything like that, you can probably empathise with personal space. Um, and what you can't see there is in that room, there will be a toilet as well, which are generally completely unscreened. So um you can imagine that there can be some uh, tensions and, um, you know, kind of distress as well. So if, you, if you're upset, you know, your, your cellmate's going to feel it too. So you can see how, how getting on together would be really important. And until you start sharing a cell, that person could be a complete and utter stranger to you. So, um, you know, some of the kind of anxiety and um, negotiation that goes on in prison cells is really interesting. Some recent research that's coming out about this, actually, it's very interesting. So in terms of what the kind of prisons landscape is, we currently have 117 prisons across the prison estate, 104 of which are run by Her Majesty's Prison Service, so are in the kind of public um, domain. We have three private companies which operate the other 13, which are kind of contracted out prisons, so are run in a private way. Um, so 13 private prisons, 104 
public prisons across the estate. And this changes. So sometimes we kind of um, close down a prison for it to be refurbished or, or for good. Sometimes new prisons get built, although we haven't had a new one built for a little while. Um, and so things do change. But this is the current state of play. And as of the end of December, so, you know, a, a, a month ago, we had just over 79,000 people in prison. So, you know, a, a high number, but not as high as it has been. And the vast majority of these prisoners held in custody are male prisoners. So almost 76,000 and around 3,000 um, females. And to look after all of those people within custody, because that, that is essentially what, um, what you know, there's a duty of care to. The prison service employs 58,000 full-time staff, of which just over 22,000 are prison officers. So um, they're involved in the day-to-day -day management um, of the prisoners and the prison um, order. And just um, to give you a bit of an idea of how those prisons are spread out, um, there, there will have been changes. This, this is a map, I think, from um, maybe 2011. Um, so there will have been changes, but you can see they're kind of spread out um, across the country. Scotland has a slightly different um, criminal justice system. So it's not this is the England and Wales map. Um, but some things to know is the kind of the spread. And you can see they're quite centralised. There's quite a good number or a, a amount of prisons within that kind of central belt but as we get out to the kind of extremes especially in the in the kind of Welsh sector there you can see that if you were sent to prison in Wales and you were from North Wales then you would be a long way from your home potentially and that has impacts for visiting and all of those kind of things and that happens in the female estate and in the youth estate as well because they're smaller in number than the than the adult male population. The number of prisons for women um, and for juveniles in particular are more um, kind of dispersed around the country because we have less of them. So you might be further um, away from your home, which can have impacts, um, like I said, for maintaining contact, particularly in terms of visitation. So, when we're looking at um, the aims of imprisonment, which is a really important question when we start to think about prison quality and asking this question of prison works, you need to uh, ask yourself, or, or I'm going to ask you, what you think the aim or purpose of prison in the UK is. Or to put it another way, what do we aim to achieve by sending people to prison? So what we've got the what we aim to do and what we actually um, do are two different things. Um, but what we aim to do really sets up that idea of, of how we evaluate what we're doing with people in prison. So um, this might not load. Oh, it is loading. Um, so that's the poll everywhere. But do feel free to use um, the chat and, and the, the questions there. So what do we aim to achieve by sending people to prison? What do you think? Deterrence, yep. Yeah. Rehabilitation, excellent. Oh, two for rehabilitation. Public safety, protect society, rehabilitation, yep. Yeah. Punishment, yep. Yeah. Aims to deprive offenders of liberties but acting as a deterrent, yep. Yeah. Excellent, Lucy, yep. Yeah. Prevent reoffending and recidivism. Yes, absolutely. Protect them from themselves. Yeah, interesting. This is um, uh, a, maybe a, a restorative um, function. Achieve justice. Yes, whatever. However, we define justice, which is another one of those uh, muddy, uh, tricky concepts to define and to get um, a kind of consensus on. Um, yeah, excellent. Really, really brilliant. Um, let me just go back to this. Ooh. So let's move on from that, if it lets me. There we go. Right. So brilliant. So the kind of associated questions with that for, that I'm not going to ask you, but to kind of leave you with is what do you think our aim should be? Are those things you're popping in there, things that you think we should be doing or um, things that we are doing? 
And can we achieve these aims? So as I kind of mentioned there about if we're saying this, that prison should be um, a form of justice, then what is justice? And what does that mean? Who is justice for? Is it for the victim? Is it for the victim's family? Is it for the offender? Is it for society? How do we fulfill those aims? And this is one of the really, really tricky parts um, about prison, prison quality, prison effectiveness, and whether prison works is how do we reconcile and fulfill all of these different aims um, of imprisonment, but you know, in the prison uh, system or the penal system, I should say, criminal justice more widely. It's a really, really fundamental um, problem. So the prison service, they don't uh, run every prison, prison, remember, the private sector um, have their own kind of mission statements, but they're kind of, um, they have to kind of answer to the to the same uh, principles as, as the public sector. So this is the uh, prison services official statement of purpose. So Her Majesty's prison service serves the public. So some of you were put in um, that public element in your responses about aims there. Um, by keeping in custody those committed by the courts, our duty is to look after them with humanity, really important point, and to help them lead law abiding and useful lives in custody and after release. So quite a lot there. So their objectives, overarching objective is to protect the public and to provide what commissioners want to purchase. So you can see the kind of uh, financial economic um, aspect that, that prisons have to abide by these days. And because of this, um, we have a public and a private sector. Um, the public sector prisons, if they're not performing well, to the commissioners, um, they can be put out to tender and the private sector can compete with the public sector to run that prison. And that's what they mean. They want to be the provider of choice for prisons. Um, so to achieve this, what they're setting their aims and objectives are is to hold prisoners securely, to provide safe and well-ordered establishments in which they treat prisoners humanely, decently and lawfully and to reduce the risk of prisoners reoffending. So all of those things, um, one or more of you um, had said uh, in, in the chat there, so that's brilliant. So let's have a look at these um, individually. I'm just keeping an eye on the time because as Lauren can attest to, I tend to talk a lot. <laughs> so I just want to make sure we're, we're covering everything. So holding prisoners securely, let's have a look. So. This is a graph, um, which should have a title, very bad academic, um, of the number of escapes from prison um, over across the years from 1995-96 to last year's 2019-2020. Um, I'll show you the latest data in a second. So you can see that we used to have um, a relatively high number of escapes. And this wasn't just escapes from establishments, this was escapes from escorts and hospital and all, all different types of things. So I think that was 88 escapes in uh, the 95, 96 uh, period. Um, and this is uh, 16 escapes in 29, uh, 2019, 20. So you can see that it's it's really declined and th there's been some kind of up and downs, but, but there's been, um, a, a real decline in the number. And this has been in response to increased security measures, um, increased kind of, you know, physical security, but also what's sometimes called dynamic security. So, um, you know, relationships between um, the staff and the prisoners. So this is, um, sorry if that's a bit small, but this is uh, the data a bit more spread out in uh, since 2012 to 2021. So last year's um, data, and you can see that um, it's it was five last year. So we've gone down even more. And as a percentage of the population, even 88 prisoners escaping is a very small percentage. But when we look at five, we're talking, you know, like a thousandth of, of the population. It's not, um, it's hardly anything. Not that, not that that uh, makes it, uh, that it, they, no one should be escaping in the prison services eyes. But you can see that there was zero escapes from establishments. No one escaped um, from a prison. They were all from uh, what's called a contractor escort. So uh, the G4S vans you see driving prisoners to and from court. Um, generally, that's where the escapes happened. 
um, was when they were in the control or the, the management of someone other than the prison service, which the prison service likes to tell you. Um, and we haven't had so category A prisoners, if you don't know, are the most risky or seen as the most risky or dangerous uh, level of prisoners. They've got the highest level of risk. They tend to be held in the maximum security um, settings or at a, at a high level of, of security. And we've had um, in the last 15 years, two category A um, escapes in 2012 and 2013, but none, um, none since. Um, and you can see the escape still at large after 30 days. Most people get um, recaptured very quickly, um, but sometimes people uh, can go on the run for a bit longer. So I think we'd probably say we do quite well at, um, at holding prisoners securely. Five escapes and none from an establishment is a pretty good um, a good level of, of security. So do we provide safe and well-ordered establishments? Safety in prisons has deteriorated rapidly during the last nine years. So it wasn't ever perfect, but those kind of feelings of safety um, amongst the people within prison has really, really um, deteriorated. And inspectors, this is the prison inspectors. So there's um, uh, an inspectorate that, that have a team of inspectors that go in and inspect prisons on a kind of rolling basis, a bit like Ofsted. Um, they go in and they can do an unannounced inspection, so just turn up at the door, um, or they have a kind of a schedule of announced inspections where they go and they have access to every part of the prison um, and they do lots of um, kind of surveys with prisoners, interviews, those kind of things to really get underneath what's happening in the prison system as well as observing all of the aspects. So inspectors found that safety was not good in more than half of men's prisons they visited during 2019-20, so this is in the latest um, kind of set of reports, and almost half of people in men's prison and women's prison, so very similar percentages there, 48 and 49, said they'd felt unsafe at some point in prison. And now there's a lot of things that go into um, safety. Um, but some of the ways that they measure safety um, and well-being in prison is the number of deaths. So um, we've had uh, these have all increased. The death rate, as it says there, has been rising um, in the last decade. And we've had a large number of people uh, die in prison in the last year. Obviously, um, as we all know, we're, we're still in the grips of a pandemic and a lot of those have been um, due to COVID. But even taking um, the COVID deaths out, we're still seeing a kind of a rise in all kind of, of causes of death. And the most um, disturbing really are people that take their own life. So pe people that have self-inflicted death as it's called here. So almost a fifth um, of those people that died in prison um, were self-inflicted, 80 of which were men. So this is obviously reflective of, of the population, but also that that, um, that is the trend, that, that the uh, men in prison are more likely um, than women to take their own life, um, but women are more likely to self-harm, which is um, another form of, um, or way that, that the distress and safety and feelings of personal safety are kind of measured. Now it's an imperfect measure in lots and lots of ways, but what these, these kind of measures show is this kind of feeling of distress, of disorder, of this kind of, um, you know, cultural um, aspects almost within prisons that has a lot of violence and a lot of, of kind of personal violence. And, um, Although rates of self-harm have come down um, the, in this last year, they're at the second highest level ever recorded. Um, and women, like, as I said, account for a disproportionate number of self-harm incidents, but it's really um, been on the rise in the male population as well. But it's a disproportionate number for women still. So 22% of all self-harm incidents in the last year were with women, even though they're only 4% of the um, total prison population. So that that level of kind of personal distress is really um, felt in the, in the female estate. And assaults and serious assaults have declined um, in the pandemic, um, mostly because people have been uh, locked in their um, cells um, and they haven't had the normal kind of um, opportunities 
um, for those kind of prisoner on prisoner assaults um, in particular. Um, and assaults on staff have decreased slightly as well um, since the kind of uh, the, the uh, peak there in 2017, but they haven't decreased as far as um, prisoner on prisoner assaults have. And again, this is probably um, due to the fact that staff and prisoners still interact during these um, pandemics and it's been very um, a very stressful time uh, in lots of ways. So, um, so yes, so there are that aspect of providing safe and well-ordered establishments. It's um, although it's an imperfect measure, there is a lot of distress and disorder in prison. So we could question whether we're providing um, safe and well-ordered establishments when fifty percent of people in prison feel unsafe. And the second part of that, so safe and well ordered whilst treating prisoners humanely, decently and lawfully. Again, we've got this definition issue. So what does humane, decent and lawful mean and mean within the context of prison? And there's lots of um, academic literature that tries to kind of discuss that. So um, I haven't got time to go into that now. But uh, essentially, um, you know, are people treated um, as human beings in a decent manner, in a lawful manner, some way that you would expect people to be treated um, decently. So this was some of the responses to the inspectorate um, report when they asked people, they were talking about um, incentives and earned privileges, which is the kind of system of privileges within prison that you can kind of earn rewards almost. Um, and they were they were responding to that. And some of which came out was this idea about needs um, in prison. And um, the inspectorate found that material needs or basic material needs would, would not be met. So people in prison um, wanted access to fresh air. So, you know, a very base, um, you know, need and, and want and things that's freely available, but not, um, not freely available when you're locked in your cell for 23 and a half hours a day. Um, fresh air, fresh fruit, um, access to legal photocopying so that they can, you know, um, do their uh, legal work, towels that are clean, medication they need and underwear that fits. Um, you know, these kind of basic provisions necessary for health and decency, as they say here, undermines anything else. So when people aren't having or not feeling like they're having their legitimate basic needs met, it's very tricky for them to be able to respond in a, um, as I was saying earlier, that kind of goodwill way um, to other things, to respond to the regime, to so go into work, um, go into programmes, all of those kind of things. And that underneath there is a quote from a prisoner. How can we talk about incentives when we can't even get the basics right? Like safety, toilet roll and clean socks. So you can imagine these, these are people that are captive and we can put the kind of morality of that aside. Um, but these are basic human human needs that they've got no real power to get themselves. They're, they're captive. They need people to provide these things for them. And alongside this kind of basic physical material or material needs are the basic psychological needs like feeling safe, access to mental health and addiction services. So many prisoners um, have addiction problems and spending time outside that fresh air that, you know, um, being able to, to breathe in fresh air is really important from a mental health point of view. And these were frequently left um, unmet. So only two in five uh, men and around half of women with mental health problems said that they felt that they had had them helped whilst in prison. And this comes back, um, all of this comes down to, um, you know, resource and staffing and how the staff and the prisoners interact. Um, and that these relationships are really vital for offsetting some of these, these kind of uh, potential problems in the prison system. Um, and that prisoner quote there is really telling. So someone believing in you um, is transformative for people in prison. So you will hear from prison officers about the, you know, the one person they've managed to get through to or the one person they've connected with. Because sometimes they, they, they can't, there's too many of them, or maybe people aren't in a good place um but for some people having someone show belief in them and quite often that's a, a prison officer or maybe a, another member of staff um is really transformative and gives them that kind of push to be able to think i can do something more positive with my life so with that brings us back to those ideas of reformation and rehabilitation and is that what we're aiming for in a prison sense so 
do we reduce the risk of reoffending? Which is one that is really, really key and one that is quite often touted as the key um, measure of effectiveness of criminal justice sanctions, punishments in general, not just prison. Um, Again, it's a very tricky concept to pin down um, in terms of data. So how do we know who's reoffending? Is it just those people that are convicted? Well, actually, uh, probably a lot more people are offending than that. How do we measure the rate of reoffending? Do we say if they've committed a less serious offence, that that can be um, a sign of some form of recidivism? Generally, it's if they've committed a crime, any crime, that counted as, as a reoffend, uh, a recidivist rather than a desister. So um, reoffending rates are generally um, high. And for those serving short sentences of less than 12 months, the rates are even higher. So um, we we see these um, these rates and you can see there's this kind of when you kind of aggregate these, it tends to come out at around 50 percent. So around 50 percent of people are reoffending. But you can see that the um, the the changes there children tend to reoffend at a higher rate um lots to do with their kind of stage um in in offending most people grow out of crime for example by their by their 20s even if they were were prolific before that um but this 12 month sentence is much higher uh, they are um they are very uh inefficient in terms of what we're aiming to achieve with prisoners because there's very little time to do anything with them by the time they're in they've got their sentence they've probably already got time served they'll probably be let out um you know at, at before um that 12 month period and there's, there's nothing they're just holding them for for amount of months so they very quickly um return quite often um so when we see this uh the and we compare it with community sentences um, for people that are prolific offenders. Um, when we're using a short term sentence rather than a community sentence, the odds of reoffending increase. So we've got to start asking ourselves when we're talking about prison works or what works is, well, what, what are we basing this on? If our aim is to reduce reoffending for certain portions of people, then prison is completely ineffective. So why aren't we looking at something else? We'll, we'll come back to that on an, another day. But some factors affecting reconviction, you might already um, have a good good knowledge of these um, and, and they're quite, uh, you know, intuitive in some ways. So um, receiving family visits. So maintaining those family connections is so vitally important, but so tricky um, in prison. Um, so you can see the difference in reconvictions there between people who had no visits and people who did have visits, you know, quite a stark 20 percent difference in uh, reoffending. People who were living with their family on immediate release. Again, this about this family connection, this kind of, you know, being um, bonded to something is really um, important. And you can see that those living with family also had a lower rate of reconviction. Drugs, we're coming back to this, this kind of theme of, of drugs here and the kind of importance. Um, so a lot of people come in with a drug problem um, or a, an addiction problem, I should say, not, not always just drugs. But if they are continuing or go back to using cl class A drugs in particular here upon release, you can see that that's, a, that's an over 30 percent difference in, um, in reoffending. So really targeting our our response to um, addiction is really vitally important. Um, and jobs, jobs is a, a really, really important, again, to this kind of idea of having something bigger than yourself, something that you're responsible for, um, you know, and, and, and creating a positive pro-social um, aspect to your life. And you can see there's a 20% there's a difference there between those that are employed and those that are unemployed. But as I'm sure you um, all know and have awareness of, getting a job once you have been um, in prison in particular can be very very uh, tricky so the prison service tries to help um, with all of these factors um, and accommodation on the first night following release um, is a really important um, target but as you can see um, of all of the prisons um, only 17 out of the 98 that gave data for this achieved that target so knowing that the people that were released from prison on any um, day um, had accommodation so had somewhere to go 
they uh, only 17 reach that target and employment. So one of their key performance targets is to is to get them uh, employment from six weeks. And this obviously moves into the probation service, a, a part of this uh, process too. only four out of the 99 prisons um, that provided data uh, achieved that target. So you can see that these things that are really important, we're failing at quite dramatically in terms of providing support for it. So let's have a little recap. Do we protect the public? So remember, these are the things that they aim to do on the left there. Protect the public is the umbrella um, concern by holding prisoners securely, providing safe and well-ordered establishments and reducing the risk of offending. So we're pretty good at keeping people securely in prison, locked in, basically. Um, we're pretty good at that. Uh, still needs to be some work done on providing safe and well-ordered establishments and we're not so good at reducing re-offending so uh, let's see whether whether we can decide whether prison works and Lord Wolfe which uh, some of you may have heard of he used to be the chief inspector um, of prisons and he did the um, report into the strange ways riots which happened in the early 90s that was a response um, or the, the rioting was a response to these atrocious living conditions that the prisoners had and they were saying that this is not legitimate it's not okay this is not humane it's not decent it's not lawful although we didn't have that terminology then that's that's post wolf uh, report but he's a very very savvy uh, man and says the prison service has to live with prisoners during their time in prison the rest of the country lives with them afterwards we cannot afford to lock them up and forget them we must ensure that the service makes proper use proper use of the time that a prisoner spends in prison and the best use of the money available the aim must be to reduce the likelihood of prisoners reoffending after release so this is really important and this this key point about prison service living with them the rest of us protecting the public extends beyond the time they're incapacitated in prison we do a good job essentially of protecting the public by incapacitating people in prison we keep them in prison securely that we do a good job at that but protecting the public extends further than that if they're going to come out commit another crime which will probably involve another victim very few crimes are victimless and then go straight back into prison that's not protecting the public in the long term and the vast majority of prisoners will be released from prison. So there are very few prisoners um, that will spend the rest of their natural lives in prison. We do have some um, that are given uh, what's called a whole life uh, sentence um, and they will never be eligible for parole. But the vast majority of other prisoners will either come out on a designated day if they've got a determinate sentence or if they've been given a life sentence will have the opportunity at least um, to be released. So this is an important aspect is that protecting the public and what happens happens also beyond the prison gates. So just to recap from the kind of academic side, what the aims of imprisonment uh, are to be retribution and this and, and I think um, when I asked you that question, what do you think uh, we aim to achieve in prison? You covered all of these things, which is brilliant. So retribution. So this idea that there's punishment or just deserts um, for prisoners. Um, so they they should be punished for the crime that they committed. Um, incapacitation. So this idea of protecting public, so keeping this a criminal group away from the rest of us. Um, deterrence, so putting off others, but also putting off themselves. So there's a kind of individual level deterrence there. So this idea that if we send people to prison, it, it should be a horrible place to put them off. I'm, I'm not saying that, that I agree with any of these necessarily, but there are um, kind of nuance in there. We'll have a look at a bit more in a minute. Um, and rehabilitation, so reforming characters and restoration. So restoring justice to victim society and also the person. So, you know, is there an element of restoring um, or, or 
restorative aspects within the offender or the criminal themselves? What could we restore them to be? A, you know, a decent member of society, a useful member of society, as the prison um, service objective goes. So that's what the kind of literature says. We talk about these different aims. And when we're looking at these things, can prison fulfill all of these things? Should it be aiming to fulfill all of these things? So, you know, there's some kind of, um, you know, discussion about, are we trying to do too much um, by saying that prison should fulfill all of these different aims? Can we do it? Are we setting ourselves up for failure? Are we setting ourselves up for the fact that prison doesn't work? So, quick question. If I had to ask you what you think this building is, what would you say? Let's pop, it, pop in the chat for me. If you if this, you saw this picture in the newspaper or anywhere else, what would you think that this, this building was? Lauren thinks it's a school. Yes, or could be a school. Yep. University, yeah. School, yeah, it's definitely got a, a school university look, hasn't it? Maybe a psychiatric hospital, yeah. Can see a hospital idea there. <laughs> a prison in Sweden, rosy, <laughs> close. <laughs> museum yes yes i hadn't thought of that but actually yeah i can see that so yes yeah, so let's just show you a few more so nice i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't mind our kind of like staff common room to, to look like that it looks that looks quite nice 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 wooded area there i mean the the, the fence might give you a little bit of an idea but um some nice pieces of art. We've got some lovely bits of art around our uh, university walls. It looks quite similar to that. I'm sure hopefully you've, you've got some lovely pieces of student art around your different schools. Now, my when I went to university quite a long time ago, my um, student room was not that nice. <laughs> it was, it definitely, definitely wasn't that nice, but that could be um, a student room, a student uh, dorm room. But um, you were correct. Well. It's, it's in Norway. Um, it's a, a prison, a maximum security. So all this is a maximum security prison called Holden um, in Norway, but it is a prison. And they've got some Banksy style art, which is quite um, amusing and, uh, and nice. So I'm just gonna show you this, um, this short video. And Lauren, do I assume we've got till 11, so I think I'm doing OK for time. Yeah, um, don't worry, Vicky. We, if we need to, if it does run over slightly anyway, it's not a problem. If if students can stay and they've got questions, it's no problem. Oh, lovely. Thank you. I think I'm, I'm coming to the end now, so there should, should still be plenty of time for questions. Um, but this is just a, a little video that shows you. Um, so the way I'm moving here is this kind of idea of what, what can we do differently? Um, and this is just a, um, a video about prison by design, so how can we do prisons differently? So hopefully you can all hear this. These photos look like they're from a hotel or a fancy college dorm room. There's a gym, common areas and private bedrooms. But this place, just outside Halda, Norway, is a prison. There's no barbed wire, lots of greenery and striking contemporary art. Inmates even have pretty great views out of their cell windows. It's all part of a plan to make prisons more humane through design. The underlying philosophy behind humane prison design argues that the look and feel of a prison shouldn't be a punishment. The sentence is taking away the freedom. Everyday life shouldn't be a, a sentence. And the first thing designers focus on is the basic architecture of prison buildings. In most prison architecture, facilities are consolidated into one contiguous building. A courtyard design uses a rectangular building around a central outdoor space. In a telephone pole design, rows of buildings are stacked like a ladder. And radial designs have corridors that branch out from a central hub, like spokes on a wheel. While these layouts are good for moving lots of inmates around efficiently, they restrict prisoners to identical indoor hallways day after day. And tight quarters can unintentionally create tension and conflict. So humane prisons are often laid out in a campus design where facilities are split between separate buildings with a surrounding perimeter wall. At Norway's Halden Prison, housing is located here, while education and visitation spaces are here in separate buildings. 
This means most inmates have to start their day with a commute, mimicking life in the outside world and providing easy access to outdoor physical activity. And unlike other layouts, which have windows that look out onto the prison itself, campus design gives inmates a rich view of their surrounding environment. This access to nature also helps inmates track the passage of time. The inmates felt that they were in a diving belt. They were um, disconnected with time and with space. Spending time outside and seeing days and seasons pass through windows helps reduce this problem. Plus, the grounds of humane prisons are usually landscaped carefully. At Halden, tall birch and pine trees dwarf the buildings and obscure the perimeter wall, lending what designers call an anti-authoritarian feel to the campus. Inmates are never made to feel intimidated by the architecture itself. Building materials influence humane design too. In other prisons, interiors are made from hard materials like concrete, linoleum, and steel. Materials like this block light are visually unappealing and constantly reflect noise. In prisons like Halden, you'll see glass to let in natural light and materials like cork and wood to muffle noise. But humane prison design isn't just about architecture and materials. It's also about what happens inside the walls. Halden's design affects the way correctional officers and inmates interact. Because housing is broken up into small communities with a shared kitchen and communal space, correctional officers can easily monitor inmates through regular face-to-face -face contact instead of observing large groups of people from a distance. And the guards' rooms are intentionally designed too small to incentivize them to move out into the inmates' common area. And this, that the guards are together with the, the inmates, is a very important security system. Campus layouts help that relationship flourish. A study of architecture in Dutch correctional facilities found that campus design ranked highest in inmate staff relationships. And U.S. prison studies from the late 90s found that this style of direct contact resulted in fewer violent or security related incidents. Designing these humane prisons costs money, which is why most of the groundbreaking work is happening in Western Europe and Scandinavia, where smaller prison populations and more robust social support systems allow for more flexible experimentation. And because U.S. prisons often prize cost saving over design, it's still uncommon to see them here. But places like Halden are setting a new precedent for what the prison of the future could look like. It's so important to have a human uh, behavior towards people so they are not so angry, but give them uh, human dignity. It might feel counterintuitive to create pleasant, well-designed spaces like this for people who have committed crimes. But under a design philosophy like this, being imprisoned is the punishment. The architecture doesn't have to be. So, really interesting, just a really short video there, and there's lots and lots. The Scandinavian um, approach to imprisonment is so um, interesting. And they have, they really do have that that kind of rehabilitative philosophy. This idea that people are sent um, to prison as a punishment, not for continued punishment. So taking away their liberty is the punishment. And then that kind of wolf idea of well, what what do we then do with them? They're all going to come out. So in in Norway, they don't have. Um, indeterminate sentencing so even even people that have committed really really um horrendous crimes probably crimes that would get them a whole life tariff um in this country their i think their maximum length of sentence is 21 or 22 years and that's it at that point that person will come out so they they know that they've got 21 years at a maximum to do something different with that person to make that person still feel a part of the community from which they're drawn and from which they will return to um so we don't adopt we have we have some of that philosophy um absolutely in terms of how we approach rehabilitation but currently um and scott is quite a, a kind of criminal a, a critical criminologist in, in this uh, area about prisons um but says that prisons are part of the crime problem not a solution to it so what could we um do differently or what should we be doing differently so ooh, we can we can learn from norway and the other kind of Scandinavian uh, prison approach. So unprison the prison. So do we need those kind of austere conditions that, that I um, showed you in those kind of first pictures that I kind of opened this session with? Do we need them to look like that? Do we need them to feel like that? 
in order to be punishing? Is the punishment just the loss of liberty? The fact that through that loss of liberty, you can't kiss your children goodnight at night. You can't choose what you have for dinner every night or go outside whenever you feel like it. Um, so do we need this these kind of continued levels of punishment over and above the pain of that of that loss of liberty or, already? Focus on relationships, both inside and outside, vitally important, as you've, you've seen, um, even those kind of design aspects there that encourage that relationship between staff and prisoners who are day to day the people that they see. Um, and those those repeated interactions and those relationships are really important, both for security, but also well-being and distress and all of those kind of things. Trust, empathy, um, humanity, decency, all of those things. So uh, focus on individuals rather than homogenous groups. So don't um, don't look at people as, as as I've said a number of times throughout this session, adult men. Well, that's quite a, a you know a, a, a differentiated group. Women who have who have generally been treated in the kind of prison system as um, or the the prisons have been designed for men because they are mostly uh, male prisons. And then women have been put in them. So I think there's a there's a kind of quote that says women's prisons are male prisons minus the urinals and painted pink. I mean, they're not they're not kind of fit for purpose. They're not fit for the needs and responses of women. So, for example, some women might be pregnant when they go to prison. Some women might have small children with them and um, that they can you know, keep their babies with them for so long. What what kind of experience is that? A lot of people are parents. That includes the men in prison as well. How do we respond to that? How do we keep um, keep those kind of relationships? Focus on desistance, so the stopping of offending rather than reoffending. So although that kind of two sides of the same coin, traditionally we focused all our attention on why people continue to offend, why people reoffend, why people leave prison or leave a sanction and reoffend again. What we haven't traditionally focused on is it's it's a relatively recent criminological phenomenon. So the last kind of 30 years or so, which for criminology is relatively recent, to have this focus on desistance. So why people stop. So talk to the people who have stopped offending. And again, desistance can be a bit of a muddy concept. So, um, you know, how how long is a, a length of desistance? Because you can't actually say, well, tomorrow they might go and commit another offence. So they're not a desister. So, you know, there's this idea that you can't actually say someone's desisted until they're the day they die and you know they haven't committed any crimes before that. Um, but even so, people that we think have stopped committing crime or self-report has stopped committing crime, ask them what the kind of process is and the progress. And really important to that is this focus on hope, belief um, and other people believing in you, this idea of, of thinking of an alternative future. And all of these things we know, they're in the literature, there's research about them, we see them in other countries. So Norway, for example, has a reoffending rate, it's not perfect, but a reoffending rate of 20 percent, um, which which is is kind of universally uh, low. Um, so they're obviously doing getting something right. Um, but what they do have in addition, uh, different to us, is a resource level of resource. So their staff prisoner ratio is one to one. So they every single prisoner has um, has a, a prison officer really that's that's there for them. We don't. Um, we have way too many prisoners and not enough prison staff. So our resource capacity to deliver that level is is uh, reduced. So until we reduce the amount of people we send to prison, which um, we imprison at the well, along with Scotland, at the highest imprisonment rate in Western Europe. So you can see Norway's uh, down there at 56, um, which obviously has helped keep their prison population low as well. Ours is 132, which has reduced um, in recent years, but not significantly. And this this fuels our prison population, which you can see that graph there. That's how it's changed over the last 30 years. And it's kind of steadied and then started to decline in the last five or six years. But it's projected to rise by at least 19,000 more people by 2026. And this is um, fueled or they think will be fueled by the recruitment of 20,000 new police officers. So obviously more people out there um, to, to uh, detect crime. 
um, and also the backlog that we currently have um, in court um, due to COVID. So there's going to be a lot more people being processed through the system. So there are a number of reasons for this projections, but they are just projections. We don't know what's going to happen, um, but this is why it's projected. So it's an upward trajectory again. Um, and the other thing is reduce the length of time we send people to prison for. So this is another trend that's done nothing but kind of um, increase, um, even though it has come down slightly. Um, so two and a half times more people were sentenced to 10 years or more um, in the 12 months to June than they were in 2008. And people are now meaning they're in prison almost two years longer. And you can see if we're sending more people to prison for longer, that pool of people within prison, just gets bigger and bigger and bigger year on year um, or at certain time points of the year anyway. So until we've addressed those kind of fundamental um, concerns, um, can we ever um, say that? So I was just going to end with, so do you think prison works? But you all started with no. So <laughs> I'm not sure you'd, uh, you'd end with, uh, with anything different. But hopefully you can see that potentially some things about prison works. It depends on how we're defining it, um, but also that we could have something different, but a lot um, has to change and it's kind of um, ducks in a row to get there. Right, so um, I've, I've waffled on at you until um, 11. Uh, so I'm hoping you found that interesting, but if anyone's got any questions, please do um, pop them in the chat and I will uh, do my best to answer them.